hey, guys, you know what? The Fed doesn't know what they're going to do a month from now. I mean, a month is a long time. Um, they're data dependent, so they don't know what inflation is going to look like 30 days from now. we got another CPI number coming up, an employment number coming up. Meanwhile, the economy is very strong, and the bond market seems to be signaling that the Federal Reserve is done raising rates for now. Well, he's saying we might raise rates, we might not raise rates, but the market just doesn't care. Up 200 as of uh, this podcast. Well, I think bottom line is the, the market, right, the bond market's pricing in, maybe even Fed cuts next year, which would help a lot because now you have you know the mortgage rates up to over seven and a quarter percent as we're recording this. So it's becoming more and more cost prohibitive to buy a house. Uh, we know the banking system had four bank failures, so there's a lot of pressure on the banking system right now. So it's kind of like, look, Fed, you haven't really broken anything yet. You're kind of on this path to that soft landing. Don't screw it up. Well, I kind of disagree with you there, Ry. The inverted yield curve, which signals that there's going to be financial distress in the market. We did have something break. We had those regional banks, three big regional banks go belly up. So they did break something. So they got to be very careful here. Um, and I think that the uh, Federal Reserve is probably cognizant of that. Now, you know, sometimes I tend to be cynical when it comes to politics, but we do have an election coming up and he was appointed by the current regime. So there's a good chance that he wants to stay in that job and the administration that's in, in power right now wants to get reelected. So you got to take that into consideration, even if you're not cynical. When you say that, Bob, I hear lower interest rates in our future. <laughs> so I think that's a really good point. And I think that does speak to the fact that you should see financial conditions ease a little bit next year. And meanwhile, right, we've just gotten through the profit season uh, for the second quarter, came in exceptionally well, much better than was expected. And you're starting to see companies start to raise their guidance going out into the future. And that's a sign that companies are seeing Things are going to be a little bit better moving forward. In fact, when we get into next year, we've talked about this, but earnings growth is going to be like double digits. So markets are looking into the future. They haven't really fallen off a cliff here. I and mean, we're seeing some selling in here, but it's not like dire. I still think things look pretty good. Well, they do in terms of earnings because you're going to have productivity has been increasing. That's one of the things that I was concerned about over the last couple of years. We didn't see productivity increases, but you're starting to see that now, you know, with the advent of AI, you're going to see productivity increase in that way. And, and you know what productivity does is you get more production out of hours worked without it being inflationary. So, you know, we're, we're always walking this fine line, but then there's always concerns, guys. But as I always say, they're concerns, not certainties. Dad, I, I just don't think AI would be able to replace you in your weekly market update. <laughs> I, you know, Chris, sometimes when I get up at five o'clock in the morning to write that sucker, I wish it would. <laughs> I don't know, Chris. I think Bob's starting to sound more like a chat GBT bot than an, uh, than an actual uh, real prognosticator, uh, which I think was one of the <laughs> jabs that one of the uh, political candidates got the other night in the debate. So I, I love <laughs> So I would just love to see chat GTT, you know, imitate this Philadelphia accent of mine. So I think it, it, that's going to be interesting to see. Years off, Bob, years off. That technology is not around yet. But look, I mean, I think the bottom line is even with some summer selling here, which historically August is a bad month. In fact, August, September, October aren't great months. This is very typical of any given year in the stock market where you get an average of a 10% correction. We've had about a 5% correction on the S&P 500. So you have two camps here. Number one is this is just a correction in an ongoing bull market. Or you have the naysayers saying that this is the beginning of a much bigger sell-off Recession's coming, the same drumbeat we've been hearing now for a long time. And I'll mention that view has not been correct. So why would it be correct now? Well, you know what they always say, they're not wrong, they're just early. Now, they were wrong a year ago. Um, but now what they're saying is the economy is so strong, the Fed's going to be forced to raise interest rates because growth is inflationary. Uh, so, you know, you're going to hear it. You're going to hear a negative spin from certain parties no matter what. But the market is always right. And, you know, when in doubt, just remember, the market is always right. Well, you know, what, guys, I was talking to one of my clients this week, and we were going through their performance, and they made the point to say that their portfolio hadn't gone up in years. And I showed them their performance year over year, and 2022 was the only year that really had a down year. And it kind of got me thinking that, you know, it's like when the market's down, it seems a lot longer when the it seems a lot longer when your portfolio is down. Those up years just seem to fly by. Well, the market's really cruel. I mean, if you you know think you know, the market's going to love you because you love it, it doesn't love you back, as you always say, Rye. And you know what, Chris? 
the market only spends 5% of this time, but it's all time high, which means you're always behind what your recent high was. Now, no one ever remembers how much money they invested 5, 10, or 15 years ago. They only remember what was the high mark, and that's where they want to start. So that's just human nature. It's, you know, it's recency bias. Um, and again, that's why, you know, markets are so interesting and so hard because they play with you mentally all the time. You know, I wish I wish the government would take that stance. We'd have a self-adjusted cost basis to your mar all-time market high. <laughs> and another interesting stat that I caught this last week is if you start looking at Europe, um, they actually had positive growth in the second quarter as well, right? And we've just heard so much negative news out of Europe. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is, like, they're not, that, those economies are not falling off a cliff, even with the war in Eastern Europe, even with oil prices being really, really high. And if you look at Japan's economy, it's on track to grow 6% this year. They're just crushing it. They're, they're, you have a lot of exports out to emerging markets. Um, and that's an economy that's been kind of a yo-yo for many years. But I think, you know, we always talk about the U.S., but I mean, the global economy is really shaping up right now. So it's not just in the U.S. here that we're seeing surprises in the positive. We're seeing it all over the world, which is one of our proponents for having a global portfolio. Well, you know, we finally had a market last year. I think, Chris, that was a good point about last year, 2022. I think it was the first time in a long time, you know, where you had a balanced portfolio that was down, where you had stocks and bonds down at the same time. It's very, very rare. Um, so typically when you have, you know, a market where interest rates are going up, it's going to negatively impact everything. But, you know, I think what you have to start thinking about as an investor is looking forward. And in the future, I think, you know, the next move is up it's to the upside in, in stocks and bonds because the next big move in interest rates is going to be sideways to down. Yeah, and that's a great point. And I think also just, in, you know, on top of that as well is don't trust the naysayers. <laughs> you know, we've heard all year and we heard this last year, too, is like, you know, good news is now bad news and bad news is now good news. And I said this, I think, on the podcast last week, good news is always good news. It's always good to have low unemployment. It's always good that housing starts are picking up. It's always good that industrial production is moving up. And it's always good news retail sales are going up because people are buying stuff. Like these are never bad uh, <laughs> issues to have. That's the sign of a healthy economy. And it's just remarkable. You can spin good data bad. Um, and you can always come up with a pessimistic outlook. But I mean, look, on, a, on an overall basis, the economic data has been pretty good. We've said it before. Inflation has been coming down a lot. Wages are staying strong. Uh, as the economy continues to grow, like, this is what you want. It doesn't get better than this. Well, you know, my favorite chart is the history of the market. You go back to 1926, you go back to 1940, you go back to 1953 when I was born, and you look at any chart of the financial markets, and they're moving up on a perpendicular line from left to right. But, you know, you, could, you have peaks all along that way. And uh, one time I did a presentation where I took that chart and at every peak I said, this is the top, this is the top, this is the top. Everybody loves to call it top. There's never been a top in history, right? Every single advance has been met by a decline, which was temporary, and then new highs inevitable. And I think that's the best lesson you can learn as an investor to remember that, that, you know, I think when we look back at every dip, it's always an opportunity. But now when you sit there and look at the future dip, it's a big risk. And I guess that's what sells newspapers. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 133, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want a second opinion, here's a shot to do it, and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan. Bob, Chris, and I will run for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We look at everything. In fact... Know the firm out there will do this. We'll build you your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, where there's an income plan for retirement, how to draw from your portfolio, how to take Social Security, how to factor in inflation. Your costs are going to double over the next 20 years. You need to factor that into your financial independence plan. We're going to look at diversification. Has your portfolio been a yo-yo the last two years as markets have been all over the place? Or have you been sitting with way too much cash paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do. We're going to put together a full investment game plan tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to tell you those high cost products like annuities, mutual funds, insurance products, brokerage products, structured products. 
We're going to do a deep dive of every investment you own, show you where all the hidden costs are, show you how to reduce that cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars, you want a second opinion, go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, at our firm, Pain Capital Management, we're big believers in diversification, diversify your risk. And we've never really been a big fan of owning individual stocks. And I think this past week exemplifies why we don't like to own individual stocks. You saw Foot Locker down 68% over five days. Dick Sporting Goods down 26% in five days. Macy's down 15% in five days. And Peloton down a whopping 78%. Man, oh, man, stocks, when they go down, they can go down fast and they can go down big. Well, you know what? I was actually walking down the streets of Newport this past weekend, and I walked past the house, and there was a Peloton sitting in the front yard just getting rained on, getting wet. It just reminded me of those old Nordic tracks. Well, it's pretty amazing. When you look at Peloton, you know, it's hard to believe that stock was $170, I think, at the high, or uh, it's now five. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's going full circle. But, you know, I've been doing this for almost 50 years, and I've seen in every cycle, you know, you have some stock that's a you know, darling of the market, and you sit there and say, well, what if, if I had all my money in that one stock, like NVIDIA, for example? You know, you, you don't think about when it was down two-thirds last year. You just think about all the new highs it's making right now. So, you know, individual stocks is individual speculation and outside risk. And, you know, yeah. the consequences are dire. Well, we see it all the time. And I, we do have a special guest right now that just joined us. I should just mention uh, certified financial planner at Payne Capital Management, Mr. Aaron Dessen. Aaron, thanks for joining the conversation. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Hey, it's an honor, man. An honor and a pleasure. Um, and Aaron, look, I mean, you probably review more portfolios a month than almost anyone I know. Um, and I think you're seeing this right now, too, right? I mean, a lot of the portfolios we see are over-concentrated in individual positions it's a lot of tech names, and then they end up owning mutual funds that own the same thing, so it's just like an overweight of the overweight. Yeah, that's the amazing thing. I mean, we run so many retirement projections for people, and really everybody can meet their goals with a very conservative return projection, but they're loading up on these tech stocks, tech stocks and like Bob said, you know, you're only thinking about the upside, and you're not thinking about you know, what happens in the next 2008, what happens in the next dot-com bubble, where you're potentially losing half of your net worth. Yeah, that's really a bummer, actually, Aaron, uh, when that happens. Because uh, it almost happened to me, right? Because I, uh, I worked for a firm called uh, Merrill Lynch a long time ago. Uh, and because I got awarded a lot of stock at low costs, at low costs that I believed in the company and grew with the company, ended up having a significant amount of my net worth, almost my entire net worth in the stock. And thank goodness my financial advisor practiced what I preached and told me that I needed to diversify. If I hadn't, Probably be in a mental institution right now. I wouldn't be here today. I can tell you that. I'm the one who told Bob to sell that stock, which means I should get a disproportionately high percentage of the inheritance later. I think you would agree <laughs> as a financial planner. That makes the most sense. You know, you, you could you could have made your case if you paid for the capital gains tax I had to pay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you were dead silent when I talk, brought that up. But, you know, you can get blinded, right? I mean, how many times have we spoke to a corporate officer or an employee of a company and we just point out they have too much money in their company stock. And they say, well, there's no risk in this company. It's a great company. Well, what about the, you know, the, the whole market? Oh, there's tremendous risk in the stock market, but not in this specific company. So, you know, it, it, again, you get emotionally attached to an investment and, and you fall in love with a situation, but never, ever does the stock fall in love with you or reciprocate that love. So you've got to be really careful. Well, a great example of that was back in the early 2000s with Enron, where they were offering Enron stock in the 401k. So people had, you know, Enron stock, their 401k, they owned it in their brokerage accounts, and then their pension was dependent upon Enron. And then when it went belly up, I mean, people lost everything. Well, that's a great point, Chris, because, you know, Enron, they lied about their numbers. So you could be the smartest analyst in the world, and you're analyzing phony numbers, coming up with a phony conclusion, right? You're absolutely right based on the numbers where the stock should be priced. You don't know that the that corporate officers were lying. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's even worse than that, Aaron. You and I worked on a case recently where, you know, forget just the stock. Um, you know, the bonds a lot of times can go to zero. Like we had a client that had Credit Swiss bonds. 
And Credit Suisse almost went out of business if UBS didn't buy them. And they had like, what was it, like a quarter of a million dollars in those bonds, Aaron? Right, exactly. And that's supposed to be the safest, most conservative part of the portfolio. And the crazy thing is they had no idea that they were exposed to that kind of risk. Not until our meeting, by the way. Well, that's the thing. The problem with our industry, and there are, there are advisors out there that use that word guaranteed, right? Well, those bonds were guaranteed by the company contractually, right? The way people sell annuities, they sell corporate bonds. There are no guaranteed investments, right? Other than, you know, uh, government bonds that are backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So, you know, they, they, they throw this number guaranteed, this word guaranteed around uh, and misinform people. And of course, as I always say, guys, risk is something you don't recognize only in hindsight. Well, you know, Dad, you made that point about, you know, companies lying about their numbers. But, you know, it's not just it's not just the companies themselves, but also the rating agencies. Remember back in 2008 during the housing crisis, you know, they were rating these mortgage subprime mortgage backed bonds. Triple A when they shouldn't have even been investment grade. It's a great point. I think the biggest risk today is is technology specifically is looked as a safe haven or defensive. Well, you don't have to go back more than last year to see Nvidia, which is up 120 per excuse me 220 percent this year, from peak to trough last year was down over 65 percent. So that's not a safe haven. Anything that can go down over 60 percent in a 12 month period. That's not defensive. <laughs> you know, that's that's called an awful buzz kill that you only find out in hindsight. And Aaron, I know you and I, we've done a ton of meetings together lately. And it just amazes me how many people are overweight at the overweight of technology in their portfolio and just don't even realize it. Yeah, you really see that recency bias a lot. I mean, I think Microsoft is a good example. If you look back at the dot-com bubble, I think it took Microsoft 13 years with the stock doing nothing. The company's increasing the revenue. It's a great company doing very well. And the stock price, there's just a disconnect there because the valuations just get so high uh, in these moments of euphoria and thinking that's the only bet in town. Well, you know, like the biggest problem is hindsight's 2020. Um, you know, you look at Apple, right? And everybody looks back and says, well, that was an obvious trade. Everybody knew Apple was going to be the greatest stock in the history of the market. Well, it's funny. When I met Steve Jobs, he got fired by Apple, right? And I have the research reports from back then. Everybody said Apple was going out of business, right? So it says, yeah. Oh, you picked Apple over Netscape or AOL. Give me a break. You know, it's just if you make money in an individual stock, you're more lucky than you are smart. That's just the way it is, guys. Well, the other big mistake is, and I hear this all the time, is well, I'm watching the company closely. I'm watching all the reports. <laughs> like you on the outside, has any? I was at Merrill Lynch working there, and I had no idea within the company that they were leveraging up mortgages on the other side of the balance sheet in the North Tower, now where I didn't work. Um, and they actually lied to us about what was going on within the company, being in the company. So as someone who's following a stock is going to be able to figure out when that stock is you know, going to go up or down is pure nonsense. Because again, just talking about some of these stocks this past week that dropped 20%, 30% in one day, you can't account for that ahead of time. That's why individual stocks are so dangerous. Right. I always thought you were such a big wig at Merrill Lynch. I thought you always lunched with the CEO. <laughs> I think I worked in the cafeteria. You're mistaken, Chris. I worked in the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Aaron, you talk about Microsoft. I mean, back, you know, in the 90s, um, it was the largest holding and one of the largest holdings in our growth ETF or our growth index fund that we use. Um, and then over the last, um, I guess, you know, 10 years after that, it became the largest holding in our value portfolios. So the stock went from being a growth stock to a value stock back to a growth stock. So, you know, anybody that was able to predict that really has an interesting crystal ball. You just don't know. Um, and, you know, you talk about capitalism. It's all about creative destruction. You know, there's always someone out there looking to eat your lunch. And there's nothing, you know, more fraught and with more risk than an individual company. So it's, it's really about diversification. It's kind of a no-brainer. Um, and it's, again, we don't allow anybody to speculate in individual stocks. We let them set up their own cowboy account. Because and, and we always make them put it in a taxable account because we know we're going to be able to write it off at some point, generally. Yeah, that's a great point, Bob. And I mean, you know, it may not be the most exciting thing, but that's why owning the index is just just the best way to go. I mean, you say it all the time, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword and just take the guesswork out of it. You know, the average market returns are going to get you there. That's the thing. You know, when we look at these uh, reviews that we do with the prospective clients, all the clients that we manage, um, you know, 90 percent of every review we've ever done was the investor was taking way more risk than necessary to achieve their goals, right? It's not, it's not about timing the markets. Again, it's about timing the markets. 
but most of you have enough money to achieve all of your financial goals without the stress of watching something that you love go down by 90%. I don't care if it's just one holding in your portfolio. You lose 90% of the value, it impacts you so emotionally, sometimes you never recover. Well, you know, you made the point earlier about people having um, the same stocks across their portfolio, even when they have a mutual fund. I, I remember I looked at a portfolio a few months back. They had a lot of Apple stock, and I pointed that out, and they said, yeah, but I have all these diversified mutual funds. Well, guess what the top holding was at each of those diversified diversified mutual funds? Apple stock. Bingo. You know, guys, I've been through every cycle that there's been in the last 50 years, and, you know, at one point it was GE was the only stock you needed to own. Cisco was another one you only needed to own. And I remember, and this is something you might want to do in a cocktail party when somebody's telling you how smart they are, they have all their money in one individual stock. You just say the same thing that I always said. You know what? I missed that one. You're really good at this. What's the next one? And they'll say, did I tell you I own Cisco? Yeah, you did. Tell me about the next one. You know, you're so good. You knew, right? We don't know, all right? It's either you're lucky or you're smart. Eh, I think you're lucky. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob. Hoi Fung Foods, I hope I'm saying that correctly, maker of the popular <laughs> sriracha sauce, cut production after a couple of bad harvests of red jalapenos. Price of its 28-ounce bottle, usually less than $10, surged to $70 or more a bottle. I mean, I love sriracha sauce, but I don't know about it at $70 a, a bottle. Well, you know what? Sometimes I wonder if you're really my son because I don't like hot sauce and you love it. You have that asbestos tongue. Not sure where that came from. Maybe maybe it came from your mom. But uh, fortunate for me, that price increase doesn't impact because I've never, ever had a bottle of sriracha sauce in the house. There you go, Bob. So uh, you're not feeling that inflation. Good for you. More money you can spend on uh, hair vitamins. All right, Chris. <laughs> Changes in reserve status all take a long time. In the 19th century, the British economy was the world's largest, with the pound being the world's major currency, the U.S. economy size surpassed Britain's in 1916. That's kind of fascinating. It's actually before the end of World War I. Um, but it wasn't until after World War II that the dollar became the world's major currency. It sounds like China's probably not going to take over with the yuan anytime soon. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I think, we, uh, I think we should start using the pound again. We should import more tea and more Jaguars. Hey, Bob had a Jaguar in the 80s. It's it true. looked awesome, but didn't run that well. He never owned one <laughs> twice. There's a reason. But you know what, guys, I keep getting emails and calls from clients about the, the BRIC, uh, you know, the acronym BRIC, right? Uh, they're going to get together and form a currency to replace the dollar. I mean, look how hard it is for the euro, you know, to get along, right? And they're neighbors, and they, get, and they, they, they have to get along. Now look how hard it was for them to put the euro together. They're not going to come up with a new BRIC currency to replace the dollar. Trust me on this one. Your lips to God's ears, Bob. All right, Aaron, pop quiz. And I think put the answer in here, so it's not really a great pop quiz. Which country exports <laughs> the most cars? Germany, Japan, or? China, believe it or That's not. That's right. Uh, the number two economy surpassed Japan in the first half of 2023. Full-year exports should exceed 4 million vehicles, up from 1 million or so pre-pandemic, uh, according to UBS. Uh, That's actually a pretty wild stat. I didn't realize China built that many cars that go overseas. Really? Well, I can't think of... You know, any Chinese manufacturers that I see in the U.S. on the on the road right now, uh, but it puts a you know, new meaning to made in China. Well, I think a lot of it's sold to the emerging markets um, and they sell them a lot cheaper. So I have a feeling that uh, our politicians won't let uh, the market be flooded with Chinese cars. Just my guess. Aaron, I think we should start the first Chinese car dealership. <laughs> <laughs> by doing Bluebell? I'll report you guys on Fox Business and I'll say uh, I'm concerned about the practices by that dealership. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's a good thing nobody listens to those pundits anyway. That's right. Well, gentlemen, another great show. Aaron, great to have you with us, brother. Love to hear that deep, booming voice. Great to be here, guys. Thanks so much for having me, as always. Hope you enjoyed episode 133, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love it. Please give us a five-star ratings on iTunes. Leave a comment. Tell everyone how great we are. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe. If this is on YouTube right now, you're watching it. You can like this episode. Subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.